Porsche is one of the most cherished cars in the world, recently celebrating 75 years of excellence. But before Porsche was a gigantic automobile brand, it was a dream from a man who came from nothing. You see, Ferdinand Porsche was an immigrant with no money, no connections, and no real hope. And Ferdinand's journey to building such a successful company is an astonishing underdog story. However, I must warn you that what sounds like an inspirational success story actually takes a much darker, disturbing turn, as Ferdinand would become heavily involved with the Nazi party and its most notorious leader, eventually landing Mr. Porsche in prison for war crimes. Honestly, I've covered a lot of fascinating automobile business stories, but this one is shocking. This is the insane true story of Ferdinand Porsche. The story of Porsche begins in the late 19th century, in a charming village called Masserdorf, nestled in the picturesque Czech Republic. It was on a fateful day, September 3, 1875, that a remarkable boy came into this world. Growing up, there was something extraordinary about Ferdinand. He possessed an insatiable curiosity for engineering, and an unwavering love for all things mechanical. But Ferdinand's upbringing in Masserdorf was not without its challenges. It was a small town, and his father was a master tinsmith by profession. Although he grew up learning the family business, his mind was hooked elsewhere. Ferdinand wanted to explore the marvels of engineering and mechanics. He was a brilliant student throughout school, which led him to attend Imperial Technical College in Reichenberg, where he received a comprehensive education in engineering and technical disciplines. And at the age of 18, an incredible opportunity emerged for Ferdinand in the automotive industry. He secured his first job at Bella Egger, an electrical firm based in Vienna. Although he didn't pursue a formal engineering education, Porsche wasted no time in establishing himself as an engineering virtuoso. His breakthrough moment arrived when he created the revolutionary electric wheel hub motor for Bella Egger. This groundbreaking invention allowed for direct movement of the wheels, bringing the world one step closer to the era of automobiles. After five fruitful years at this initial job, in 1898, Ferdinand's path intertwined with that of an eccentric inventor named Jacob Lohner, forever transforming his life. Lohner, a visionary in the realm of electric vehicles, promptly recognized Ferdinand's exceptional aptitude and warmly embraced him as his protege. Together, they embarked on a daring mission, an audacious quest to construct a fully electric car. In a small workshop, Hidden from prying eyes, Ferdinand and Lohner toiled day and night, experimenting with batteries, motors, and innovative designs. Their unwavering commitment finally bore fruit when, in 1900, they triumphantly unveiled their magnum opus, the awe-inspiring Lohner Porsche Semper Vivis, the world's first fully functional hybrid vehicle. Just a year later, they presented yet another marvel, the Lohner Porsche Mixed Hybrid, featuring a combination of an internal combustion engine and electric motors. The news of his groundbreaking invention spread like wildfire, igniting the curiosity and admiration of prestigious automobile manufacturers across the globe. Among them, Austro Daimler, a renowned name in the industry. Drawn to Ferdinand's exceptional talent and visionary ideas, Austro Daimler extended a generous offer, inviting him to join their esteemed engineering department. Ferdinand's most remarkable achievement at Austro Daimler was the creation of the illustrious Model 2780, affectionately known as the Prince Henry. In an era where automobiles were a rarity, often reserved for experimental ventures and racetracks, this exceptional car stood out as a testament to Ferdinand's ingenuity. The Prince Henry car was crafted with a specific purpose in mind, conquering the highly esteemed Prince Henry trial race in 1910. This grueling competition attracted the finest automotive talents, in a display of sheer excellence, the Prince Henry dominated the event, clinching the top three positions in a sweeping triumph. By 1916, Porsche had risen to the position of managing director, and his achievements were further acknowledged when he was bestowed with an honorary doctorate from the Vienna University of Technology. With the outbreak of World War I, it became evident that the dynamics of warfare had undergone a significant transformation. The war was no longer solely reliant on manpower, as now advanced technology and heavy machinery played crucial roles. And who was in high demand? The engineers. 
Ferdinand Porsche made notable contributions during World War I. He designed the Austro-Daimler M. Porsche system, a heavy artillery tractor that provided crucial support to battlefield artillery units. Additionally, Porsche worked on improving aircraft engines, enhancing their performance and reliability. And after the Great War, Ferdinand Porsche returned to his true passion, creating and building race cars. His next remarkable achievement came in the form of the Austro-Daimler Sasha. This car was unlike anything seen before, with a smaller and lighter design and featuring advanced engine technology for its era. The Sasha took the racing world by storm, boasting an incredible track record of winning 43 out of the 53 races it entered. In the following years, the company Ferdinand Porsche was working for merged with Benz and C, resulting in the formation of Daimler-Benz. As a result of this merger, their collective products were now referred to as Mercedes-Benz, marking the beginning of an era for the renowned automobile brand. Ferdinand was responsible for giving birth to the design of the Mercedes-Benz S-Class series, whose popularity remains today. Additionally, Ferdinand Porsche was instrumental in the creation of the extraordinary Mercedes-Benz SSK, a sports car that reigned supreme in both speed and luxury during its time. The SSK, short for Super Sport Kurtz, or Super Sport Short, was truly exceptional. It boasted a top speed of 120 miles an hour, making it the fastest and most prestigious sports car of its era. With only 40 units ever produced, the SSK became an exclusive and highly coveted automotive gem. But Ferdinand's ambitions were not confined to a single company. It wasn't long before disputes erupted between Ferdinand Porsche and Mercedes-Benz directors, and Ferdinand resigned from the company, going on to work for Steyr Automobiles. But the year was 1929, the very same year when the stock markets crashed, resulting in the period known as the Great Depression. As much as it affected the whole world, it was terrible for the automobile industry. Amidst the colossal economic downturn in history, the magnitude of the crisis was such that people's priorities no longer revolved around purchasing and engaging in the exhilarating realm of racing cars. And as one thing led to another, Porsche was soon made redundant and was left without a job in the middle of the economic crisis. Undeterred by the circumstances, Ferdinand Porsche refused to let this hurdle deter him. However, there were no job opportunities available, as companies struggled to survive during that time. And so, against all odds, he took the momentous step of establishing his very own company, Porsche GmbH, which provided designs and consulting services for motors and vehicles. Porsche made a clever decision by not immediately jumping into manufacturing his own cars. With financial support from his son-in-law, Fernando Porsche was able to assemble a team of top-notch experts from the automobile industry. Many of them were his former colleagues and friends from his previous work experiences. However, the most significant addition for the future of the company was undoubtedly his own son, Ferry Porsche. Ferry was right in the footsteps of his father with a natural talent and love for engineering, and he took the same interest in designing cars as Ferdinand. They started by designing a car for Wanderer, a middle-class vehicle. Ferdinand Porsche also decided to work on his own car design, which was based on a small car concept he had worked on before at Daimler-Benz in Stuttgart. To finance this project, he took out a loan using his life insurance as security. But due to the challenging economic conditions, car commissions were hard to come by. So Porsche took a bold step and established a company called High Performance Engines Limited. His goal was to develop a racing car, even though he had no specific customer in mind at the time. He designed the P-Wagon project. Meanwhile, in 1932, four struggling German auto manufacturers merged to form Auto Union GmbH. Seeking a showpiece project, the company's chairman enlisted the expertise of Ferdinand Porsche, introducing him to a new leader in a new political party in Germany. The man was Adolf Hitler. And in 1933, during the Berlin Motor Show, German Chancellor Adolf Hitler made two significant announcements. The first was the creation of a people's car, which would later evolve into the KDF wagon or Volkswagen Beetle. The second announcement focused on establishing a state-sponsored motor racing program aimed at fostering a high-speed German automotive industry. As part of this program, Hitler agreed to allocate an annual sum of 500,000 Reichmarks to Mercedes-Benz. However, Ferdinand Porsche was able to convince Hitler it would be more beneficial for two companies to develop the racing car project in the interest of Germany's glory. 
As a result, Hitler agreed to provide an annual stipend of 250,000 Reichmarks each for Mercedes and Auto Union. With this funding secured from the state, Auto Union acquired the P-Wagon project. Since the notorious Hitler was already impressed by Ferdinand's work, the master engineer was called in yet again for military services. One notable endeavor was the involvement in the design of the Tiger I tank, renowned for its thick armor and powerful armament. Porsche also played a role in the development of the Tiger II tank, called the King Tiger, which boasted even heavier armor and a more potent gun. Porsche's engineering expertise extended to the creation of the V1 flying bomb, but in November 1945, as the war ended, Ferdinand Porsche found himself facing a new chapter in his life. Asked to continue the design of the Volkswagen car in France and relocate the factory equipment as part of war reparations, he embarked on this challenging task. However, his time in France brought unexpected conflicts and obstacles. On December 15, 1945, French authorities arrested Ferdinand Porsche, along with his son Ferry Porsche, on charges of being war criminals. While Ferry Porsche was released after six months, Ferdinand found himself imprisoned. The legal proceedings surrounding Porsche's imprisonment and trial were heavily influenced by his involvement in Germany's war effort and his personal relationship with Hitler. The Porsche family claimed that the whole affair was a thinly veiled attempt to extort money. However, the family's account concealed the use of forced labor to the true extent of their wartime operations. It was later revealed that approximately 300 forced laborers, including Poles and Russians, were employed in Porsche's factories. These laborers, often Slavic prisoners of war, were subjected to harsh conditions and frequently worked to death. The post-war French government demanded a payment of 1 million francs for the release of Porsche. Initially unable to gather the required funds, Ferry eventually secured the amount with Cisitalia, an Italian car brand for whom he developed a Grand Prix motor racing car. Alongside their collaboration with Cisitalia, the company embarked on a new venture, crafting their own design. This groundbreaking creation would bear the family name for the first time in history. Set in an old sawmill in Gamund, the Porsche company commenced the production of their pioneering masterpiece, the Porsche 356. With meticulous craftsmanship, they hand-built a mere 49 cars. After the tumultuous years of war and imprisonment, the Porsche family returned to their hometown of Stuttgart in 1949. However, they faced a daunting challenge, how to revive their business and rebuild their legacy. The banks, cautious and skeptical, refused to grant them credit since their plant was still under American embargo and could not serve as collateral. In a bold move, Ferry Porsche, the driving force behind the resurrection of the company, took one of the limited series 356 models from Gamund and embarked on a mission to secure orders. He personally visited Volkswagen dealers, seeking their support and proposing a unique approach. Ferry asked the dealers to pay in advance for the cars they ordered, enabling the funds needed to jumpstart production. Back in Stuttgart, a transformed version of the Porsche 356 began to take shape. Ferry Porsche envisioned a modest production figure of around 1,500 cars, hoping for a successful restart. But over the next 17 years, the Porsche 356 surpassed all expectations. More than 78,000 of these iconic vehicles would roll off the production line. The Porsche brand had re-emerged stronger and more determined than ever. Furthermore, Porsche's relationship with Volkswagen took on a new dimension. They were contracted for additional consulting work and every Volkswagen Beetle manufactured resulted in a royalty payment to Porsche. As the Beetle's popularity soared, with over 20 million Type 1 vehicles produced, Porsche enjoyed a comfortable income from this collaboration. However, tragedy struck. Ferdinand Porsche, the visionary behind the brand, suffered a stroke that left him debilitated. Despite his determination, he could never fully recover. On January 30, 1951, the automotive world mourned the loss of Ferdinand Porsche, age 75. Shortly after Ferdinand's death, Porsche's most recognizable involvement in race cars began at the 24 Hours in Le Mans, when an improved version of the 356 debuted on this track and won in its category. 
As Porsche's reputation as a sports car brand soared, the hype surrounding their vehicles reached new heights. They realized that the time had come for a new offering, so Porsche embarked on a project that would break away from their previous ones. This undertaking was entrusted to Ferry's son, Alexander Porsche, a visionary in his own right. Inheriting the family's passion for automotive innovation, he came up with a revolutionary model called the Porsche 901. However, Peugeot legally advocated for a name change because of their registered trademark involving automobile names featuring a zero positioned between two numbers. Consequently, the vehicle's name was modified to Porsche 911. With its distinctive design, rear engine layout, and exhilarating performance, the 911 quickly captured the hearts of car enthusiasts around the world. Over the years, Porsche faced some challenges as they navigated through changing market demands and economic downturns. One of the most significant difficulties came in the 1970s, when the global oil crisis hit. Rising fuel prices and stricter emissions regulations forced Porsche to reevaluate its product lineup and seek ways to improve fuel efficiency. During this time, Porsche introduced the Porsche 928, a grand tourer with a front engine layout in an attempt to diversify their offerings. However, despite its technological advancements, the 928 struggled to replicate the success of the 911. Porsche faced financial difficulties, and rumors circulated that the company may be acquired by another automaker. But Porsche didn't give up. They made a strategic decision to focus on their core strength, the 911. The 911 underwent continuous evolution, incorporating new technologies and improvements while staying true to its heritage. It went on to become their best-selling unit, and it quickly established itself as one of the best sports cars money could buy. The business was booming for Porsche. The possibilities were endless. However, the Porsche family involvement in the company was officially over when, in 1972, Ferry stepped down from his chairmanship. The company was transformed from a private partnership to a public limited company. Despite these changes, Porsche still went on to deliver exciting new models. In the 1980s, Porsche introduced the Porsche 959, a technological marvel and a benchmark for the automotive industry. The 959 showcased groundbreaking features, such as all-wheel drive, twin turbocharging, and advanced aerodynamics. It demonstrated Porsche's commitment to pushing the boundaries of engineering and cemented their reputation as an innovative and performance-oriented brand. However, the course of Porsche's success took an unexpected turn in 1986 when fate dealt them another challenging blow. The main challenge stemmed from the company's ambitious attempt to take over the much larger automaker, Volkswagen. Porsche had been steadily acquiring shares of Volkswagen since 1980, eventually accumulating a majority stake of 51%. However, this move put Porsche in a vulnerable position because it had borrowed heavily to finance the acquisition. And unfortunately, the financial markets experienced a significant downturn in October 1987, leading to a crash known as Black Monday. The crash resulted in a severe liquidity crisis for Porsche, leaving the company unable to pay its debts. Porsche found itself on the brink of bankruptcy. To add fuel to the fire, Porsche's sales dropped. Within a period of five years, they were only selling half the units per year. It was mainly due to high exchange rates and high costs of production, since Porsche would not compromise on the quality. The times were extremely rough, and by the end of 1993, the annual total sales consisted of barely 14,000 units. To address these difficulties, Porsche implemented cost-cutting measures, including layoffs. Still, it wasn't enough. Porsche needed something concrete to fix their financial issues. And the answer came in 1996 in the shape of the Boxster. It was Porsche's first roadster since the iconic 550 Spider of the 1950s. The Boxster was a mid-engine two-seater convertible designed to capture the essence of a classic sports car while incorporating modern technology and features. The Boxster was positioned below the flagship 911 model in terms of price and performance, making it more accessible to a broader range of customers. The launch of the Boxster helped revitalize Porsche's sales and image. It attracted new customers to the brand and appealed to a younger demographic. The increased sales volume and revenue generated by the Boxster allowed Porsche to reinvest in research and development for future models and technologies. And in the early 2000s, when the SUV market was on the rise, Porsche decided that it wanted a bite too. 
but the decision to enter the SUV market was a significant and pivotal move for Porsche. It represented a departure from the traditional sports car niche. By leveraging the reputation and brand recognition gained from the Boxster, Porsche took the bold step of introducing the Cayenne SUV in 2002. The move was met with skepticism and raised eyebrows, as the introduction of an SUV seemed like a departure from their core identity, and there were concerns about diluting the brand and compromising the company's image. But despite the initial reservations, the Cayenne turned out to be a game-changer for Porsche. The Cayenne quickly gained traction, attracting not only traditional Porsche enthusiasts, but a new segment of buyers who desired a high-performance SUV. Excited by the positive response to the Cayenne, Porsche expanded its product lineup further by introducing the Cayman Coupe. This two-seater sports car filled a gap in their portfolio, offering a more affordable alternative to the iconic 911 while still delivering the thrilling driving experience that Porsche was known for. Together, the Cayenne, Cayman, and the enduring popularity of the 911 provided a diverse range of options to cater to different customer preferences. In 2011, Porsche introduced the second generation of the Cayman, featuring updated styling, improved engine options, and advanced technology. Around the same time, Porsche underwent a significant corporate change. In 2012, Porsche became a subsidiary of the Volkswagen Group, with Volkswagen acquiring the majority of Porsche's shares. In 2013, Porsche unveiled the 918 Spider, a groundbreaking hypercar that showcased Porsche's expertise in cutting-edge technology and performance. The 918 Spider combined a powerful combustion engine with electric motors. The company then began expanding its presence in the electrical vehicle market. In 2015, they introduced the all-electric Porsche Mission E concept which showcased their vision for the future of electronic mobility. The Mission E concept promised high-performance electric driving and a range that would rival traditional combustible engines. Building upon its Mission E concept, Porsche introduced the Taycan in 2019 as its first all-electric production car. In recent years, Porsche also ventured into new segments, introducing the Macan Compact SUV in 2014 and the larger Cayenne Coupe variant in 2019. Looking ahead, Porsche remains at the forefront of automotive innovation. It has a record 19 outright wins at the 24 Hours in Le Mans and currently stands as the world's largest race car manufacturer. In a survey conducted by the Luxury Institute in New York, Porsche was awarded the title of most prestigious automobile brand. Porsche also won the J.D. Power & Associates initial quality study in 2006, 2009, 2010, and 2014. As far as reliability is concerned, a Canadian study revealed that 97% of Porsches from the last 25 years are still on the road. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon so you don't miss any of our future videos. And if you can't wait for another video, check out this one right here taking a deeper dive into the dark past of Volkswagen and how they rebranded themselves in the 60s to become known as the Hippie Mobile. I'll see you in the next one.